Standing behind me is J.J. Julian. He's a real honest-to-goodness firefighter. He spent 32 years in service as a professional firefighter. Then he's going to give us a, an overview of the attack that we suffered on 9-11. On this Sunday, September 11, 2011, in memory of those that were there on September 11, 2001, in the attacks of the Twin Towers in New York, we are here to remember and honor those who lost their lives on that day. This was not the first attack on America. December 7, 1941, comes to mind. Japan was planning some kind of an attack. Top commanders of the armed forces ignored the warnings, and as a result, those ships assigned to the Pacific fleet that were in Pearl on that day, along with a lot of their personnel, were decimated by three waves of Japanese fighter planes loaded with torpedoes and bombs. The USS Arizona still lies as a memorial and a reminder that such attacks should not be taken lightly. Let us have a moment of silence to remember those who lost their lives that day. <clears throat> Let's move forward now, 60 years to that day, September 11, 2001. Again, our government had prior knowledge of an attack. It was dismissed because they knew not where, when, or how. On September 11th at 8.45 a.m., on a clear beautiful day in New York. The sounds, the normal sounds of that morning were interrupted by the roar of jet engines of American flight, a Boeing 767 loaded with 20,000 gallons of jet fuel. It slammed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. The impact left the gaping, burning hole near the 80th floor of the 110-story skyscraper, instantly killing hundreds of people and trapping hundreds more in the higher floors. As, we evacuate, as the evacuation of the tower and its twin were underway, television cameras were broadcasting live images of what initially was thought to be a freak accident. Eighteen minutes later, after the first plane had hit a second Boeing 767, United Flight Airlines 175 appeared out of the sky, turned sharply, and slammed into the second tower, about the 60th floor. The collision caused a massive explosion that showered debris down upon the streets below in the buildings. America was under attack. The hijackers were Islamic terrorists from Saudi Arabia and several other Arab nations. Within moments of the attack on the World Trade Center in the skies over Pennsylvania, United Flight 93 with its passengers and hijackers would meet in a cool rage of desperate courage as passengers would take back their airplane before it could reach its later reported destination, the White House. What made Flight 93 
different was a decision reached by the passengers over the western skies of Pennsylvania. They had learned by their cell phones from loved ones on the ground that they would likely be flown into buildings. They decided to fight and take back the aircraft. The act, knowing its outcome, took raw courage. With a unanimous decision, the passengers at this point charged the cockpit, broke open the door, and attempted to take the aircraft back. Sadly, the hijackers forced the controls forward and United Flight 93 started a very steep descent. <coughs> At speeds of over 500 miles an hour, it slammed into the ground in a field outside of Shanksville, Pennsylvania. It is reported by the transponder that had been recovered from the aircraft that the passengers were reciting the 23rd Psalms. Amen. <laughs> because of the lack of communication and cooperation between the federal agencies of the FAA and NORAD, F-16 fighter jets that could have been scrambled and intercept the two remaining aircraft were delayed. They would have been after them with heat-seeking missiles. An officer's an awesome decision to be made by a fighter pilot. Flight 93 became a part of the day of horror that cost almost 5,000 lives. Buildings toppled that had previously stood proudly on the New York skyline. Flight 93 became additional casualties. Within 30 minutes of the two planes hitting the World Trade Center, American Airlines Flight 77 had departed from Dulles International Airport bound for Los Angeles. However, It, like the other three that had departed, deviated from their flight pattern, made a new turn, and were now heading east. Surveillance cameras at the Pentagon would later show that Flight 77 was flying so low that it took out light poles in the parking lot before slamming in the outer ring of the Pentagon, penetrating three rings deep before disintegrating. There was many lives lost in the Pentagon that day. The number of casualties as a result of the terrorist attack, again, was over 5,000. Over 3,000 were civilians at the World Trade Center. 60 passengers and the crew that were aboard Flight 175 that hit the South Tower. Flight 93 with 40 passengers and crew. City of New York Fire Department lost their lives as they ascended into the World Trade Centers for the purpose of rescuing those that were in the building. Fifteen EMTs, twenty-three New York police officers, thirty-seven Port Authority. Seven Port Authority police officers lost their lives on that day. 
may be known that many firefighters from across this great nation, some on their own time and their own money, came to New York to assist in the awesome task of recovery and cleanup in the days following. Since that day of the attack, scores of firefighters, police officers, construction workers, and others involved in the awesome task of cleanup have had to retire because of illnesses caused by the dust, debris, and toxic fumes. Even yet as this day, people continue to lose their lives, suffering from different blood disorders and lung diseases from the attack. Later in this day's service, the signal 555 will be told, signifying that those officers, those firefighters that gave their lives that day had answered their last alarm. I can assure you that those firefighters that entered that building knew that they probably weren't coming out. Because of their courage, <coughs> their dedication to the, to the profession of firefighting, ascended so others could come down. Thank you. I uh, want you to take your Bibles, I'm going to be brief, but uh, I want you to uh, open to Proverbs chapter 27, Proverbs chapter 27, you know, all of us in this room have something in common, we come from many different places, from different ages, our backgrounds are different, but we all have something in common. All of us, without exception, in this room today are one day closer to the end of our life. There is a day appointed when each of us will die, and we are all one day closer to uh, that day than we were yesterday. We all have that in common. The Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die. Now in Proverbs chapter 27 and verse number 1, read it with me. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. <coughs> Proverbs 27 1. One time uh, I was studying that verse in my office and several other verses that are connected with that verse. And uh, as I did, I had a piece of paper in my hand and I outlined uh, some things that I. Uh, thought we should all think about. Four facts, if you would, about the truth of, of uh, that verse. And I want to speak to you very briefly this morning on those uh, four facts from that uh, verse and related verses. Here's the first one. Today is the only day that I can be sure of. Today, this day, this hour, this moment, is the only one I can be assured of. Because life suddenly can end. 
like that. 9-11 was an example, but it happens all the time in smaller situations. But you've seen it and I've seen it. If you're very young, maybe you haven't seen it, but you will. I remember when I was pastoring in Miami, we had a great day one Sunday. It just seemed like God was especially present in that service. There were decisions for Christ. And it was a wonderful day and we had another good service that evening. And standing at the uh, door of the church, two ladies came up to me and they said, Pastor, we've had such a wonderful day. You know what we're going to do now? We're going to go out to a restaurant. We're going to have some fellowship together. And I said, that's great. And I said goodnight to Ruth and to Vera. And they left. They, the uh, church was on Southwest 16th Street. And they headed for the, one of the local restaurants. They got down the, the street less than five minutes away. And a drunk ran a stop sign. Smashed into their automobile. Ruth was instantly killed and ushered into heaven. Vera was hurt real bad and was taken to one of the local hospitals and I received a phone call uh, very quick, very quickly I received a phone call telling me what had happened. I left the family at the house and headed for the hospital. And Vera would make it, she would live, but Ruth had gone to be with the Lord. I came home that evening and uh, it was fairly late, but my 13 year old son, Randy, was waiting up for me. This had really shook him up. He was 13 and he was a good kid and he was doing some things for the Lord, but it made him realize for the first time in his life, Randy realized life can end like that. And he said to me, Dad, I, I really haven't done that much for the Lord. I, I really want to get down to business. So we were in the Florida room in that house. I never will forget it. Just Randy and I, and I, I opened the Bible and I shared some scripture with him on the subject of dedication, dedicating yourself to serve the Lord after you're saved. Father and Son got on our knees in that Florida room and he prayed the prayer of dedication and gave his life to serve Christ. Amen. He's a missionary pastor today on the island of Molokai in Hawaii, doing a great job there. Out in Indiana a few years ago, I believe it was January 1st, 2002, a Southern Baptist pastor and his children and his wife were driving down a, a street, a road actually. And they were driving down a road and as they drove down the road, a tree fell on their car. The tree was a dead tree, but there was no wind blowing there was no apparent reason why that tree would fall at that instant. But it did. And the father, the mother, and two of the children were ushered into the presence of God just like that. We never know. It happens to good people. And it happens to bad people. It can happen to any of us. We never know. Um, uh, a short time ago, over in Orlando, there was a teenage boy, 16 years old, and he was uh, sitting on his bicycle on the sidewalk, waiting for some friends. They were going to go shoot some baskets. And all of a sudden, a racing car down the street came and left the road and smashed that young man, and his life was taken just like that. We never know. Life is short. And so uh, we need to remember that today is the only day that we can be certain of. I remember the time a, a, a male nurse came to me. He was a member of our church in Miami. He said, Pastor, I've got a young man in our hospital. He's dying, but he doesn't know it. He's not going to make it. He's only got a short time to live. He's 18 years old. He said, Pastor, I've told him all about you. And he wants you to come and visit with him. So I went to the hospital and met the young man. He was very glad to see me, very open. Didn't know about the Bible. Had never heard the gospel. I shared with him from the Bible. I uh, shared the gospel with him. And he received it. He wanted Christ. And he prayed with me and accepted Christ. 
And for the next few weeks, while he was alive, uh, he was so glad that he was saved. He was hurting as the weeks went on, hurting physically. But he was so glad that he was saved. And a short time later, he left us and he went to heaven. It was just a few months later, Mel came to me again at church. He said, Pastor, I've got another one in the South Miami Hospital. Pastor, he is like the last one. He's not going to live. He's going to die. He, too, is 18 years old. He doesn't know, but he's going to die. But, Pastor, I've got to tell you this. His mind's in the wrong place. He wants to meet you. I told him all about you, and he said, have him come. But he said, Pastor, his mind's in the wrong place. He said, recently, he had some of his friends sneak some booze into his room at night. He said, not only that, Pastor, but a couple of nights ago, he had him sneak in uh, a girl for illicit purposes into his room at night. So his mind's in the wrong place. And so, I, uh, I said, I'll go see him. And I did. And he received me well. He was polite. But he, uh, he didn't really have any interest in what I had to say. You can tell. He kind of grinned, nod his head. But it really wasn't penetrating. And uh, he received me nicely. He wasn't rude. But I could tell he, he wasn't ready to accept the Lord. He probably thought he had a lot of time. He was young. Lots of time. A few weeks later, his life was over. The scripture says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day you bring forth. I want to tell you, if you're visiting with us this morning, we got some great Christians in this church. I'm so proud of this congregation. They love the Lord. They serve the Lord. It's not like that all over, but it's like that here. They love the Lord, serve the Lord. They don't fight. They don't squabble. They just roll up their sleeves and go to work. And they do it quietly, but they go to work. Man, they're working all the time around here. Our deacons deek. Our yoke fellows yoke. Our stewardship stewards. And our trustees, well, you can trust them. Uh, this is a working bunch, and it blesses my heart. I am always going around and going up to people in our church and saying, Thank you. Oh, what you're doing is great. And I'm finding somebody else to thank them because that's what we're all about here. And if you're looking for a good church, a church where people mean business for God, I'd recommend you take a close look at this church. Now, if you want to find a great people, this is it. If you're looking for a great pastor, uh, you can look somewhere else. Uh, you, you can find a better pastor, but you won't find better people than what we got right here at First Baptist of Oxford. I was thinking about that the other day, just a few days ago, and I thought, it's time to write a poem. This poem is not about our people. But this poem is about Christians all over America that are not doing much, if anything, for God. And that's a tragedy. That is a real tragedy. We don't expect the heathen to serve God, but God's people ought to be busy serving God. Amen? Amen. I call this poem, Living for Me. Twiddly, 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 D. I'm living my life just for me. Soon, I'll die. So today, I'll play. I'm twiddling, twiddling my life away. I should live for the Lord. I, I know that's true. But I'll leave all that up to you. I'm like the ostrich. My head's in the sand. That way God can't reach me. Understand? You serve the Lord and pray for me. Because I'm busy playing. 
twiddly D. <laughs> twiddly, twiddly. Twiddly D. Thank you, Lord. You died on the tree. But, twiddly, twiddly. Twiddly D. I'm going to live my life for me. <laughs> Number two, I should plan like I'm going to live for a long time, but I should live like I'm going to die tomorrow. Does that make sense? Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10 says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. This is the day that we should serve the Lord. Hold your place in Proverbs 27. Turn to James. James 5, uh, 4, please. James chapter 4. Go to verse number 13. James 4, 13. Come now, you that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into a city and uh, uh, continue there a year and buy and sell and Get name? Whereas you know not what shall be on the next day. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. In view of this, we should plan like we're going to live for a long time. That makes good sense. But live like we're going to die tomorrow. <coughs> Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Number three. Fact number three, I should remember that God has promised to be with me always. We don't know what's coming. None of us know what's coming. None of us know what we're going to have to face in life. None of us as Americans know what the enemy has planned for us. I was listening to one of the senators being interviewed the other night. He's on the defense committee. And he said, y'all ought to know that since 9-11, there's been 40 desperately serious attempts to hit us again. And we've caught them all 40 times. Then he reminded us what President Bush said right after 9-11. We have to be right every time. They only have to be right once. We don't know what we're going to face. And it's high time in America that Christians who know the Lord get down to business for God and pray for God, uh, pray to God for our nation and work for God and do the work of God. It's our only hope. I know that much. I don't know what we're going to face, people, but I can tell you this. He's going to be with us. He's promised never to leave us nor forsake us. Hebrews 13 and verse number 5. Psalms 23 uh, is, a, is another good scripture on that. Oh, there's so many good uh, scriptures on that. Now, God called me to uh, serve Him as a minister 44 years ago. 44 years ago, I had a business in Miami. I had two children and was soon to have our third child. And God... Uh, definitely called me to the ministry and was convinced, I was convinced, it meant getting rid of the business. It was a new business. It meant signing the signing the, the papers over 
to the uh, company that I was in partnership with and just walking away from my investment. And now I was going to have to be, I was going to be going to Bible college full time from like 7 in the morning until 1 in the afternoon. I'd have to find some work of some sort in the uh, afternoons and in the evenings to support the family. And uh, we wondered how we were going to make it. But we knew God was in it. We knew God was going to take care of us. He doesn't call, but what He provides. And uh, so we, uh, we said we're going to do it. There was a song at that time that was pretty popular. It says, I don't know about tomorrow. Anne sang that song at uh, the little church we were attending at the time for the people. And uh, these words are so appropriate to your situation, my friend. They were appropriate for our situation, but they're appropriate for your situation as well. Here's the words, I don't know about tomorrow. I just live my life today. I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't uh, worry over the future, for I know what Jesus said. And today I'll walk beside Him, for He knows what is ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. 